Kentucky, you are in Twinsburg, Ohio, which every year has the Twins Festival. And so tens of thousands of twins come. Do they have a parade and everything too? Oh yeah, they have, it's here for a week. They have all sorts of activities and it's the only thing that happens here all year long. So it's, you know, it's a big deal. And I packed up and left and I lived in Phoenix for a decade. And um, uh, the only reason to be here, I mean, other than nostalgia, you know, at a, at a certain age, elephants go back to their place of birth to die. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm doing the same, I don't know. I returned to harness racing, which I grew up around racing, and uh, I literally arranged all my business affairs around it to interfere with it as little as is humanly possible. So clients come here, coaching groups come here. Now, so how long have you been harness racing actually in the... Uh... In the bike, in the sulky? Yeah. This is my 10th uh, year with a professional license. Um, and a couple years before that, driving at county fairs and stuff, there's a process you have to go through to even get a license. How many horses do you have? It's a good question. Uh, my trainer would know better than I. I'd have to get out a vet bill to give you an accurate number. It moves up and down a little bit, month to month. I would say right now we're dealing with 18 to 20. What's the average horse cost to <laughs> buy, and then what do they cost to maintain well, annually? Well, like, like business relationships, um, much easier to get into than get out of. These are the cost to acquire in most cases is nothing compared to the cost of ownership after the fact. Somewhat like a boat, I suppose. A mm -hmm. uh, boat being a hole into which you throw money, these being investments that eat while you sleep, yeah. um, and send vets' kids to colleges. So there's, uh, in the neighborhood of, if you're lucky and you have one that doesn't have a lot of problems, maybe $1,500 a month, uh, all the way up to $3,000 a month um, uh, to really keep them performing. All right, so here we are. We're at Dan's house right now, and we're going to go down into his office and also uh, just kind of get a tour and see his working environment. I don't know if this has ever been recorded in any form before. I don't think so. Okay. No. And it's not pretty. <laughs> no, it's, it's a functional environment. So, yeah, don't expect a, a palace. That's what I think what you said That's when exactly we, we right. talked. So, well, why don't you, uh, you know, People let's expect down. A big fountain and servants, you know. <laughs> exactly. it's not, it's not so you're, we're not going to have like grapes it, it, and no, you're not going to be you eating know, grapes. It's All right. Not the way I live. Yeah. Um, um, clients do come here, of course. Yeah. This is complete isolation. So, I mean, you know a little bit my, about my work style, but uh, with very rare exception, there probably aren't five people who even have the number. There are no unscheduled incoming calls. So all my phone calls are by appointment, which my one assistant arranges in clumps. So like next Thursday is a phone day. So I'll be on the phone from seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night. Pretty much one right after the other. But the rest of the week, I won't be on the phone at all. And there's never anybody coming in. So there's really days on end with hardly any interruption. And the productivity difference of that, I mean, one of the things that people do to themselves is they put themselves in, in bad environments and then try and achieve good performance. And so, like one of my pet peeves is people talking on a cell phone in public restrooms while they're up to your IP, you know, and I make fun of it all the time. And, but I mean, seriously, if it's an important phone call, Right? And if you're not controlling your inbounds, it could be your most important client. And this guy's standing there, and I mean, I've heard the calls. They're having serious, important business conversations. On one hand, when they're standing between two other guys and all three of them are peeing, and the noise being heard on the other end ain't a fountain. And really, how can you be concentrating when you're trying not to pee on your shoes and have this million dollar conversation? It doesn't make any sense, right? And so, one of the reasons they get so much less done than they would like and when people compare themselves and say, well, how do you eight newsletters and five books a year and clients, and, you know, when they make that comparison, it's because they're working in these really bad environments. And I'm working in an environment that I've tailored to allow minimum distraction, minimum interruption, and maximum productivity. 
So for the most part, if I get interrupted here, it's because I choose to be interrupted. The same with clients, by the way. So if a client is here, um, they've paid a lot of money. And so my theory is they deserve my undivided and uninterrupted you know, attention. So there is nobody coming in. Uh, just, I just need you for five minutes. I just need you for five minutes, which if you're in somebody else's office, and I know you've seen it, you know, that'll go on all day long, right? Or they'll be out checking messages, they'll be looking at mail, they'll be checking their email every time somebody takes a bathroom break instead of thinking about what they're thinking. Never happens here. All right, so here we're in another part of the office, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of your libraries and materials in a little bit, but I'm curious, you know, we just talked about productivity, and you're all about controlling your environment. Mm -hmm. Um, and realistically, you probably get done five or ten times more per year than you know most people, if not your peers, and I'd say most productive people. I mean, if you think about the copywriting alone, I would say probably in the top tier copywriters, the six-figure fee and royalty compensated copywriters, I would say probably that most are doing maybe no more than two projects at a time, and they may be doing six, eight in a year, right? Whereas in a big year, I may do 50. Um, and, um, and it would just be impossible if you let yourself work the way most people work. Right, but again, I think the distinction here is um, environment first, but let's talk about quantity second, which is um, talk about your discipline, and by discipline I mean how many days per week do you work work, and then how many hours a day do you have for, let's call it playtime, even though it's your other job, which is horse um, activities. It, uh, the discipline itself is, is about regimen, and it is literally about going to work and working while you're working. So it's one of the reasons, there are others, but for example, um, well, and more specifically, what time in the morning do you start mm. and when do you end? Okay. How many hours a day do you put oh, in? a lot. And how many days a week? Most of the time I'll work seven days. Um, now, a couple of those days may be limited time. They may be a few hours in the morning and then I'm done. Um, but I will usually, for example, like I have a rule to write for me, for my stuff, uh, at least an hour every day. So, and I'll pretty much get up as early as I need to do that to do it in order to keep that discipline in place. Like it's a joke in our family, you know, are you gonna work on Christmas Day? You know, and the answer is, well, you're not coming out until nine o'clock in the morning. So w what difference does it make to anybody if I work from seven until 8.50? Mm -hmm. You know, when I hear you muddling around up there, I'll be right upstairs, but until then, why, gonna, why don't I, why don't I go work? You'll escape from the self-imposed <laughs> prison. Yeah, <laughs> but still, what difference does it make to you, you know? Well, you shouldn't work on Christmas. I said, okay, but, you know, you're asleep. What do you know, <laughs> okay? And if I get really bored with everybody late in the afternoon and I leave for an hour and go work, nobody will even miss me, <laughs> right? So what does it matter to anybody, you know? Okay, here we go. All right. So there she is, and she's not in much worse condition than she was. 2568 uh, Columbia Road, Richfield, Ohio. Right. So here's when you know you're having a bad day. Yep. Now this driveway doesn't look that bad, but when it's buried in eight feet of snow, it's bad. Yep. Right? And they flattened it. It used to go down and come up. So we're down to one car, which is mine. Okay, Father has no operating car. Mine is a 1960 Chevy Impala which I bought for $25 on payments, okay? And the frame is cracked. Not all the way through, of course, but cracked on both sides and tourniquet wired together with wood blocks. It is stuck in that driveway in the snow drift, deep. You can't move it. So the guy that owns the gas station comes and has to tow it out, right? Because he can't plow the drive unless he gets it out of there. So he has to tow it out, right? As gently as possible, he tries. But the jerk necessary to move the car cracks splits the frame in half, splits the car in half, and out comes one half of it out of the snow and the other half is in the snow, right? Yeah. This is when you know you are having a very, very, very bad day. When you're broke, the smallest of problems 
has epic consequences because you have no ability really to cope with anything. You're just bare, they're barely functioning, you know, a blown tire yeah. and you're out of commission because a yeah. $15 tire is out of the and question you if you work. don't have $15. Right, right. And so you might, it might as well be a million dollar problem mm -hmm. as a $10 problem because neither one could be solved, you know, and that's, that's, that's a circumstance that is that a lot of people never, you know, they can never get out of it. Um, and certainly choice, you know, didn't put me in it, but choices got me out of it. Yeah. One way or another, wealth reflects value having been provided to people who perceive it as value. Yeah, so you might big... not think comic books are valuable, you may think people should only read the Bible, mm -hmm. but if enough people find value in reading comic books, then somebody's going to get wealthy producing comic books. But the important point is you've got to find a way to provide value to the marketplace. And you have to bring value to the table. And and that now connects to all sorts of things. It connects to not tying money to work, but instead tying it to value. Um, finding ways to create leverage so that there's more value from the same amount of work instead of little value from the same amount of work. On and on and on. But but wealth is is almost exclusively value-based, value-driven. And, and everything else is secondary to that. So some years ago I have a client, actually at the time he was a poor client. He was nearly a charity case. Um, so Roy Fat, he currently owns a company called Restaurant Marketing Systems, yes. which is a leading consulting, coaching, training, marketing company in the restaurant industry. Yep. But Roy's original business, when I met him, was a little um, home delivery of pre-prepared gourmet meals business, which incidentally was called Simple Salmon, even though it had nothing to do with salmon. God knows why. It, it was cute and it rhymed to simple I guess. Simon. Okay, yeah, yeah, and there must have been a, you know, but I don't even remember what, what the reason was. But the business basically was high-end TV dinners to get you right, yeah. delivered to your home and stocked in your freezer, okay? And so he's struggling. And so Rory, Rory said two things to me. First thing he said was, anytime I get somebody to try these dinners for a week, we keep them as a customer forever, okay? And the second thing he said was, our best customers would be, and we know they tell us, they would be somebody who was who was out of food, right, and ready to scrounge around and call for takeout. If we could get them and get them to try this instead, we'd have customers for life. So the answer to the first question was, okay, let's give the meals away. Mm -hmm. If you're telling me the truth. Yeah, of now, course. Now, if you're lying, I'm about to destroy you. Yeah, exactly. You got, you got to do some demographic and psychographic profiling first. But right? if you were telling me the truth, let's do free dinners, yeah. deliver five free dinners, and you'll get customers for life. I said, the second issue is we need to be in the yellow pages in restaurants takeout. Because if that's the customer you want, and you want them when they're calling up to get takeout food, that's where you need to be. Great. So he goes to places yellow pages at. Yellow pages ad tell he, Rory calls me, says, I can't put the ad in there. I said, why can't you put the ad in there? He says, we're not a restaurant, and they won't let us be in there unless we're a restaurant. I said, well, that seems a simple problem to solve. He says, what do you mean? I said, go down and get a business license for, sim for simple salmon restaurants yeah. and go back to the yellow pages, and it's listed at the top as simple salmon restaurants, but who cares? We'd name it AAA Simple Salmon. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, bingo. He's in the yellow pages, yeah. and he's off to the races. Yeah. Bottom line is, you have a lifestyle-oriented um, mindset, and ultimately a, a lifestyle-driven business right now. You've earned that right. Yeah, although I indulged that before I could afford it. Okay. Um, in the sense that, uh, it's a good way to say it, lifestyle mindset. I mean, my, my mindset has always been and I think at odds with many business people who get caught up in the opposite. My mindset has always been that the purpose of business is to facilitate other things, uh, not, not to its own end. 
and that you ought to own it, it not ought own you. Mm -hmm. And and it is my contention that any just about any business can do that, um, not right. just mine. Right. And most people, I think, get themselves trapped into working for their business rather than having their business work for them. So while I have made sacrifices at certain points in time, for the most part, I've always insisted that it not get in the way, but rather that it be organized in a way to facilitate the other things that I want to do. This is Claire Umholtz's stable, so he has other owners okay. and a few horses of his own, but most in this barn are mine. Hi, Des. Come here. All right. Come here. Uh, this is Sultan Desby. He's an eight or nine year old, I think. Uh, Pacer, I drive him. Okay. Um, if you're looking for value, he's about a ten thousand dollar horse. Okay. Uh, he does. He do and, he, and he will nip you. Okay. He'll warn you first. Yeah. But, but he'll nip nip you. There's a zillion different bits. There's different boots, protective boots. Some need, some don't. So every Half horse is blinders, different. Blinders, full blinders. Yeah. Okay. And and. Every variable has to be tested one at a time, right? So, if you do direct mail, right, mm -hmm. which online too, right? So if you change the headline, the color, and do you put video on the website or don't put video on the website, and you do all that at one time, you don't know anything, right? You know you got improvement, but now you don't know which of those three things gave you the improvement. So you gotta test one variable at a time right, if right. you really want to know. You can't really do a Taguchi style test here. Well, <laughs> no. Um, if you really want to know what to leave in, what to leave out, and you're trying to get to point of maximum productivity, right? Same thing with this. So if you're going to fool around with sound, for example, and determine earplug, cone, not cone, you're going to test that one at a time. And for the most part, some of it you can test training. But for the most part, you're testing in races, and as in a marketing test, you're sacrificing money for the things that don't test well to ultimately arrive at the things that do test well. It's a very painful, arduous process. This Older is, horse, too? This, yeah, he's 12. Okay. And mandatory uh, retirement is 14. And, oh, you don't bite. She said you bite. You don't bite. You don't bite. Uh, this is Scormania. He's a 12-year-old trotter. He races Monday night, if you're still on driving your money. Uh, and with each year, loses a step, gets a little slower, takes a little longer to come back from his winter rest and get in gear, but uh, he may very well race to his uh, I'll retire retirement age. Oh, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. I don't have to deal with the tongue. Oh, he wants something to eat. <laughs> They'll see, like, he likes to play. Uh -huh, yeah. They'll fool around. All right, so when I started in racing, the... I was not a real welcome presence here. Um, and Why? That's, well, that's actually the understatement of the century, by the way. Um, and, and I understood it. I mean, well, here you are. So first of all, I mean, I was around as a kid, but you know, it was a 20-year gap. So here you are, rich a-hole, dropping down out of the clubhouse, thinking that you can do you, you, you know, what we do for a living that we have devoted our entire life to yeah. and compete with us. And you can throw more money at it than we can, which is really an unfair advantage. Yeah. But other than that, you know, so there's a, there was an enormous amount of ill will. And, and my trainer partner, who you met this morning, who's extremely well-liked and entrenched, um, he, he had to use up an enormous amount of political capital on my behalf. Right? And, but here's who I never had any trouble with, never, the top guys. The top guys, not only never had any trouble with, generally, they were helpful, right? It's the ones who aren't doing well, right, mm -hmm. who, 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 are, who are fearful of any new entry into their arena, mm -hmm. resentful of any new entry into their arena, and if they and if they get beat in anything, so you pull a bigger number with a promotion than that guy pulled with a bigger number. In this case, I win a race and beat you know so and so who does this for a living and yeah yeah. So that is that's that's a big deal amongst the lessers. 
the winners in every industry, in every field, the top dogs are never really threatened by anybody and generally speaking will be helpful to others, mm -hmm. whether there's some immediate vision of gain or not. I believe I hold the United States Trotting Association license uh, record for having lost this license twice before keeping it the third time, um, uh, one right after the other. And that's because? Well, because after all of the fair driving and qualifying driving and everything required to actually get out here and drive professionally, the very first race, um, inexplicably, I couldn't tell you why today, same horse I'd been driving, uh, we turned to go to the gate and he suddenly lost his mind and took off like you had just stuck dynamite up his butt and went 400 miles an hour, ducked under the gate, nearly decapitated me, and it took me uh, four miles around to get him stopped and the license was yanked by the time I got out of the sulking. So you go back, start this entire ugly process all over again. Fair drives, all this thing. Right? So I do all this, it takes another year and a half of pain and agony, and everybody's even grumpier about me being out there and all this. So now I got it again, right? I've met all the qualifications, I've done everything you need to do, I got the damn thing. Now, like a complete moron, I go out there for the first drive and drive the same horse that did it to me, and he, and, and he does it again. Now, the only good news is I get him stopped after a mile and a half, but still, the license they is gone, right? Because you can't control your horse, right? And so how long did it take to requalify the second the third, Well, the second time took 18 months. Okay. Now, there is not supposed to be any third time. Okay. There is no provision for this. There is no way to ask for it. There is no, for, you don't ask for it. You're just done. Yeah. Right? Might as well bury your head in the stand well, because exactly. you're a giant loser. Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. Now, this is not an outcome, you know, that I'm, that is acceptable to me, but there is no way to get it, right? So now you can go back and drive fares if you want to, but you are never gonna get through this process to get this, this professional driver's license because there's no way to even ask for it at this point. So amongst other things, when it came time to get the judges to agree to the qualifying, I went and got a petition signed by all the top drivers. Um, and the top driver at the time at this track, and one of the top ten in the country, I, to this day I don't know what he said, but he went in and met with the judges for 30 minutes and made it happen. Now, I don't know what he said, I have no idea. But, uh, so those guys, not threatened, not troubled, willing to acknowledge the fact that bad things happen to everybody, everybody loses control of a horse now and then, it happens. Um, and that generally speaking, it was safe and competent and qualified, not good, but safe and competent and qualified to be out there and so forth. Now, the guys who aren't doing well, who are scrounging around, you know. Um, so like I beat, in a fair race, I beat the top driver in the state on somebody's horse. And they were immediately accusing him of stiffing the horse and fixing the race for me to win. Now, we're at a dinky county fair. There's no way to make any money fixing races. They're ridiculous. But just because I beat him, he had to let me in. And they're all resentful. So now, if you if if you think about really any business you go into, so you go in when I did when I went into speaking, so you go into the sort of a closed pond, and there's X number of peers participating in that industry, in that field, in that activity, and there are a vast majority of them who aren't really doing well because the vast majority in anything and everything aren't doing well, mm -hmm. and they are going to be uh, resentful of the new one challenged by the new guy, fearful of the new one, critical of the new one, objecting to everything the new one's doing, but you rarely get that reaction from anybody at the top. And, and it tells you several things. It tells you who to try and deal with, which is go as far up the top as you can. And it tells you how you should behave getting to the top and being there, yeah. right? Because there's a profound difference between how these winners think and behave even towards competition and how to be cruel, how losers think and behave even towards competition. And, and, and the fearful or resentful attitude about anybody who figures something out that's smarter than what you figured out, that moves past you in whatever sort of ranking there is in a business, um, th that's all that's all coming from the place that you identified. It's coming from the place thinking that there's this finite 
amount to be had and any piece of it that goes to somebody else is a piece that can't come to me. So literally, the food you're getting is coming off my plate. And that just stands in the way of everything. Yeah. Um, and, and I've experienced a number of times, I experienced in the National Speakers Association environment when I entered the speaking field. Um, um, I experienced here um, those are the two profound times. Um, I experienced it in the advertising business at the very beginning on a local level in, in just one local market. Um, the new agency is not welcome. Um, and the way to have the most friends is actually to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the way to have the least friends is to be beating them. Right. You know, but you're never going to have any trouble with, with the top dogs. Yeah, well, the, the, the losers conspire, the, right? And uh, there's, there's something else that you bring up, I think that's, uh, or just this has to do with, which again goes back to competition, which is, you know, the five minute mile wouldn't exist if the greatest athletes weren't competing against each other. Well, that's right. So, so it all comes down to um, when the winners recognize and realize that when there are peers that hold them to a higher standard and they couldn't possibly be what they are without their competition and without the fact that part of the the aging process as we go on is eventually we will become irrelevant and die. Yes. You know? And yes. so you might That's as well welcome and accept it now instead of allow yourself to die a bitter old man, right? Friend of mine friend woman. of mine says sooner or later all this will become as irrelevant to you as it is to everybody else, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and and you know, and there's some truth in that too. Um uh, uh, but the the competition thing uh, competition makes everything better, and lack of competition makes everything worse. And competition makes those who compete stronger, right? And, and not only are, do you want to be competing with the best class of dogs you could compete with, but there's also uh, real top performers not only compete with others, they compete with themselves to always better their best, right? And so um, if you're creating a marketing campaign right now, what's going on in the back of your mind is how to get even better results than every previous, not just how to beat the other guys, how to get better results than you've gotten before with everything else that you've done. And, and if I sit down to create a marketing campaign for a client, I'm not only thinking about beating their numbers, I'm thinking about beating my own numbers. Man, th this one could be the big and the best and the one that's better than anything else you know, that we've ever done. Ray Kroc's great line, the founder of McDonald's, when asked on the Tom Snyder show many moons ago, didn't it aggravate him that as soon as McDonald's did anything, everybody else in the industry copied it? And he said, no, it doesn't aggravate me at all. He said, no, it would aggravate me if we had to copy them. That would aggravate me, but it doesn't aggravate me that they have to copy us as long as we make sure we invent faster than they can copy. And now that's, you know, that's, that's a winner talking about winning. There are, at this track in most races, nine of you. You are this far apart from the other one, and you're not driving Buicks. So you have the added intangible of the horse, who most are pros but can spook over something or can have a sudden injury and go down or whatever. Uh, you can get a wheel hooked so somebody can drift in or drift out and now you're here and if everybody doesn't react very well to that, you're up over top of this one. I mean my accident was essentially a four horse pile up um, and nobody's fault um, but a horse pulled out, it was a very windy night, hit a strong headwind, we were guessing, and literally stuck his toes in and then reared up, and that caused the guy behind him to, to hit him, and the guy then behind him to hit, knuckle down, and go under, and as I went out around him, I actually thought I was clear, but, and you couldn't do it for a million bucks twice, but as his went down, and he flew out of his sulky this way, his sulky came up like this, and just caught the bare end of mine, as I almost cleared, sent mine up like this and sent me flying out. And um, I landed here, bounced up in the air and came back down on my back. 
and three fra fractures, compound fractures. One real serious all the way across, two minor, um, and um, floating bone chips, you know, and they're giving you the Christopher Reeve story at the emergency room. If we don't operate and get these things, you could sever, one of them could sever your spinal. I mean, it's a serious injury. And I was out for, I don't know, eight, nine months probably, uh, wheelchair walker for a while. Um, we had our, one of our super conferences four days afterwards. And of course the docs all said, you can't go, but you know, you gotta go. So, I mean, I was there but I had to be wheeled around. And um, on stage, I stood up and spoke. Wow. But the rest of the time, I'm like, you know, one step away from death. Yeah. I mean, and there are people who have career-ending injuries out here, or series where they're out for three years, four years. A lot of broken arms, dislocated shoulders, that kind of stuff. But, I mean, you can get yourself killed out there or nearly killed. Yeah. What's your advice then? <laughs> to accelerate the uh, wisdom, experience, and confidence cycle in and for an entrepreneur? They have to understand that it is their own timidity that stands in their way more than anything else. In other words, yeah, it's, it's their, their fear and their, uh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then beyond that, um, what, what is important is to somehow structure a small victory opportunity for people so that the risk of action feels low and the, the occurrence of success, however small it may be, is high. You don't necessarily have to get to the result to be able to have a sense of successful accomplishment if you are accomplishing activities that you know mathematically lead to results. So if you structure a process by which no belief is necessary but mechanical things to do and you do these things and these victories will occur. If that can be their first sort of set of experiences, um, now you can, you can move them along further. Now, we are coming up on the right to neighbor's house and our house. So there's greenhouses in the back. Yep. So everybody but us had greenhouses behind their houses. So this, is, this at one time was the greenhouse capital of North, North America. So this English Tudor house was the neighbor, yep. and this English Tudor house was ours. Now, you can see a marked difference between this wow. house and the house we saw out in Richfield. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you can get a sense of its oh, yeah. size and its grandeur, you know, and inside it is a, you know, an English Tudor kind of mansion style house, big wood circular staircases, and um, a, um, a dumb waiter yes. up and down, laundry chute, and yeah. the, the money's still moving, and fundamentally, there's still the same money and there's additional money coming into the system. But it is actually concentrated in the hands of fewer than, than ever. And they are able to be more demanding than ever. So the demands on the person who seeks to create and exchange value for wealth now are more stringent than ever before. The person parting with their money has far more choices than ever before because of technology, media, no boundaries. He doesn't have to settle for who's local. He can, he can, he can shop globally, for example. So labor, he doesn't have to get labor to make his widget in his hometown. He can get labor in India. He doesn't, he, so he's liberated in all sorts of different ways. And so there's, there's much less tolerance for interchangeable commodity, uh, except by poor people who have no other alternative but to buy interchangeable commodity. There's much less tolerance for ordinariness. Mm -hmm. um, this is really an experience economy. So whether you and I are going out and we're going to drop 200 bucks a person on dinner, 
or somebody's going to go out and drop 30 bucks a person on dinner. Neither one of us anymore are going to be satisfied just with dinner, right? We now want uh, more than that mm -hmm. for our money. So we want more value for our money. Well, where does that value come? Well, we want more experience. We want a better experience. We want something more to it than good food on a plate. And in reality, that now exists uh, in, in every business, in every field. Now, the good news is the opportunity is also greater because fewer and fewer people are willing to rise to the occasion. So for all these reasons, there's more clutter but less legitimate competition mm -hmm. meeting the demands for transfer of wealth maybe than ever in my lifetime. A lot of people have no real appreciation of, in a sense, how easy they have it. I mean, the entire existence of that industry, the typesetting and commercial art industry, I mean, to get to get a page done, I mean, to get a direct mail package done to go in the mail was, you know, an arduous two-week process. Right. And, and you could do everything that it took you to do in those two weeks now on a Mac in under two hours. Yep. Uh, and be reproducing it and be on your way. So when I owned an audio production company in 1980, give or take, editing of audio product was still done with a razor blade mm -hmm. and tape was then put back together a word at a time by a sound engineer yep. on a soundboard. Yep. I go in and record now. It's live edited on the computer as we're doing it. And I'm walking out the door with finished product. You know, in that house we just visited, I bought uh, I bought my first uh, what would you want to call it? Success training product. Right? Yeah. Okay, which so one was it? I bought Earl Nightingale's Lead to Field, um, used from the family attorney who didn't want it on payments. So for those who don't know, Earl Nightingale company created around him called Nightingale Conan for many years, the largest publisher of um, how to succeed spoken word product in America. And Earl, uh, first person to get a gold record for a spoken word product about success called The Strangest Secret. He was a radio personality. Earl's statement was, if you, if you want to do something, whatever it is that you want to do, and you don't have any real blueprint, and you don't have any role model. So you don't have a mentor, you don't have somebody to look at who is accomplishing that, right? And at the moment, I certainly had nobody to look at who was accomplishing prosperity, okay? Um, uh, he said, all you have to do is look around at what everybody else is doing, and don't and do opposite. that. He said, at least start by <laughs> don't doing that. So you may not know what to do, but you can at least rule out It'll what be statistically not <laughs> to do, right? He said, because, and specifically about money, the majority is always wrong. So whatever the majority is doing, that's not the right thing to do. So you yep. start from there, right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I, I bought that like I, maybe to a greater degree than any other principal, idea, philosophical position has ever been put in front of me. And it resonates, you can find it as a river running through all my mm -hmm. work, and, all, and I give credit often, but all my writings, uh, all my seminars, and then personally, everything I've ever done. So every time I've entered an environment, uh, so in the advertising business, copywriting business, in the, in the speaking business, one of the first things I did is looked around at what the majority was doing and crossed that off the list. Yeah. Okay, so that, that we know is not what we're going to do. And then at least 99% of the time you'll be right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, failing any better idea, let's do the opposite, Yeah. right? Um, but so you start did, in every place I found myself hunting for and finding the renegades at, who did not conform to 
the industry norms, the rules, the traditions, the accepted ways of doing things, and paying attention to them. So in the advertising world, you know, that leads you to, to Ogilvy. Contemporarily, it led me to Halbert because this was a rogue renegade, contrary to all advertising wisdom. And, uh, and it has served me very, very, very well, you know, over the uh, years. Okay, so one of the things that you see on Dan's walls are tons and tons of racehorses. And up in his library upstairs, he has even more. And it shows Dan either coming in or in. Well, those are the, all win photos. These are. Oh, yeah. these are just wins. So, these are just wins. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't put up the photos of the, of the last place finishes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, uh, we only put up the photos of the wins. And you um, see 2,000, two, here's yeah. 2,000, 4,500, Oh, if you're looking at money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah. money here. So each yeah. one represents a purse. Mm -hmm. You have one over here that's a 100,000 winner. Yeah, that's when I wasn't driving. But I owned her. Yeah, I owned her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you still won. Mm -hmm. But it's different. A little different. Piece of trivia. This is, this is my first win after my big accident. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's also the horse that we had the big accident with. So. Wow. I mean, it wasn't her fault, of course, but. So she got the first win uh, back after I started driving after that wreck. Mm -hmm. har har harness racing uh, it has all the same benefits of golf with horse manure, rain, mud, sleet, snow, and the possibility of death added in as additional benefits. <laughs> So in about four days, he's up and he's saying, I don't know what's wrong, you know, he stops up and he says the horse won't eat, he, won't, he lays in the stall, I can't get him to go out and do anything with her. He says, well, he doesn't have his goat. You know, he says, so how much was the goat? You got it. <laughs> I love oh, it. the goat's $7,000. <laughs> <laughs> the guy storms out, you know, I'm not giving you. So like four or five days how long later, did it take? he's yeah. back, right? They got the vet down there, they're giving the horse ID. Did he double the price of the goat? He kept going up by two grand every time <laughs> the guy came, came back to the barn, right? That's awesome. So eventually he's up to like 12,000 bucks for the goat, right? The guy says, you, uh, right? I'll just sell the horse back to you. The guy says, fine, I'll give you three two, grand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's the best ever. Yeah. Love it. <laughs>